from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today our program is going to be about environmental ethics and we're so privileged to have on our program today a very distinguished guest who is very highly qualified to address our questions. I'm so pleased to welcome to the program Dr. Holmes Ralston III. Our guest is University Distinguished Professor at Colorado State University. Uh, our guest has written a, a number of books and many articles including among his works is the book Science and Religion, a second one, a critical survey another book called Philosophy Gone Wild, one called Environmental Ethics, uh, another one Conserving Natural Value, and most recently Genes, Genesis, and God. Our guest has spoken all over the world on six continents and lectured at many very distinguished uh, uh, organizations and places including the Royal Institute of Philosophy, its annual conference. He also has been a speaker in Peking, China, at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences Institute of Philosophy and at the World Congress of Philosophy. He has been a guest lecturer at distinguished universities around the world such as Yale University, Harvard, Oxford University, and the University of Helsinki among others. Uh, Dr. Ralston, it's a great pleasure to invite you to our program and you're gracious to be here today with the busy schedule that you have. Uh, welcome to North Idaho College. Uh, thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be in a place where there's lots of opportunities to think uh, critically about human relationships to the natural world right here in the panhandle of Idaho and the great uh, Pacific Northwest. Well, we're just very honored to have you here. And I'm very pleased to welcome to our program our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. Okay. And we shall invite Janelle to ask the first questions today. Dr. Ralston, it's an honor to have you here and Thank to be you. able to speak with you about a subject that's very important and very important to all of us. But it's also a very large subject, uh, the whole subject of ethics and, and the relationship with our environment. What do you consider to be some of the major ethical issues that we're facing in relationship to our environment? Well, as you say, it's a broad question. I suppose the sort of main fundamental sort of theme is whether or not we humans have any ethical obligations at all to the natural environment as such or independently of our what we humans have at stake in our own interest and welfare there. So no one would quarrel that we need uh, clean air and clean water and that human beings uh, are helped or hurt by the condition of the environment. Uh, beyond that, though, the extent to which we might have obligations to endangered species or to prevent uh, animal cruelty, like, like the hunting questions, for example, or even to uh, ecosystems, to uh, land health, those are the questions raised in environmental ethics that are new and different. And, and one that's attracted a great deal of, uh, of attention in our area has been extinction of species. Yes. And, and that's a very critical question, I take it, that you would find, uh, you would have some opinions about how we okay. might work on the ethical questions. What questions might we ask ourselves, I guess, in order to answer those ethical questions? Uh, those are quite good questions. And I think those are questions that the ethical past isn't very good at helping us answer. I mean, if you try to read the traditional philosophers like John Stuart Mill or try to read uh, Thomas Aquinas or you try to read Augustine or whatever, they didn't think much about this. I sometimes say you have to go back early in the Bible to uh, Noah and his ark, uh, which seems to be the first endangered species project. So really, our ethical past doesn't, I think, give us a lot of attention to this because for the most part, this wasn't a question people faced, okay? But we now do with escalating populations in this century. Uh, you said you're a lawyer, right? Yes. Okay, I think the Endangered Species Act is one of the miraculous pieces of legislation in the 20th century. For a nation such as ours to say that uh, we uh, don't intend without overriding considerations to put a species in jeopardy uh, 
seems to me to be essentially an ethical statement. It's written into law. It's been a problematic uh, law, as uh, nobody knows better than the people up in the Pacific Northwest, but it's still there. It shows an ethical concern, I think, for uh, putting a species in jeopardy. Professor Ralston, um, I want to take advantage of your wonderful academic background as well as the experience. There's often a conflict with different interests and even ethical questions. And I find it fascinating that, uh, that with your background that you are addressing this subject, uh, and, and it's very appropriate. We hear so often in this conflict when we're using the natural resources and how it affects the environment, not only wildlife, but the, the natural resources, how long they will last. And, and you also identified clean air and clean water. And we certainly have the hazardous waste disposal question in Idaho, the issue of nuclear waste. Uh, what does one say from the ethical viewpoint when there is a, appears to be a struggle between uh, economic development that may mean uh, certain quality, uh, prosperity for individuals, and does that have to be in conflict with preserving the environment for future generations or our own health, the economic versus uh, the quality of life? And, um, how does one resolve uh, they, they They can be in conflict. It seems to me that we were mentioning the Endangered Species Act a moment ago. For the most part, the Endangered Species Act sets certain kind of uh, benefits like uh, educational and scientific and ecological, so, sort of over against untempered economic interest and so forth. So there can indeed be conflicts of this kind. Uh, as it turns out, and you must know as a your legal background, that uh, m far the largest number of these conflicts are worked out. They're not all that many cases. They really go that far and get that sticky with regard to the Endangered Species Act. But the spotted owl is a notorious kind of case, and the snail dart and a few others. For the most part, though, the, there it can be win-win situations in which you can have your cake and eat it too. So that's, that's the good news. Uh, the, maybe the bad news is, though, there can be uh, serious conflicts. The California, state of California, has got a number of reasonably serious conflicts. The gnat catchers out there in good suburban real estate. And there are immediate conflicts. I like to argue these are short-range conflicts, that, that in the end, if you work out a better way of doing it, uh, setting aside more green space, for example, making habitat for the net catching or whatever. Uh, the, the realtors may not like that now, but I'll bet you 10 or 20 years from now they're going to be proud of the kind of things they worked out. This landscape with lots of green space in it, they're going to be bra bragging about it. We've found that to be true in times past. So the short-range conflicts at times, yes. I think longer range, the quality of life, uh, will not be jeopardized by an increasingly intelligent relation to ship to the landscape. I think that's true in the Pacific Northwest, right? You, you, you can cut those forests if you like, but they're going to be gone in 10 or 20 years with the previous rates of cutting. You might as well solve that problem early and, and have some of these forests for your children and great-grandchildren. And in that sense, the long-range conflicts, I think, uh, have to do with a deeper sense of quality of life than short-term economic interest. Thank you. I'd like to expand this into a global question ethically. Uh, certainly, uh, you have articulated uh, with eloquence the, the legislation in this country and how we are addressing the question. But we just recently passed the six billion figure in the yeah, population of the Earth. Did. And there are countries that are not addressing issues in the way we are, but this very small planet is one in which what happens in other locations has consequences worldwide, uh, both from a philosophical, ethical question, but also from uh, your basic uh, uh, knowledge. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about what you've discussed about the United States and what may happen worldwide? And how do we make this a global question? You certainly have toured and spoken in many places. And what do you, what do you come home with uh, from those trips? Well, I come home a bit more pessimistic than I used to be on the global scene. And as you suggested, population is a big part of the problem. I, uh, most of the third world countries I've been in have, have something on the general order of three times as many people in them as they did uh, thir uh, 50 years ago. T typically, they became independent from their colonial, uh, previous colonial governments more or less half a century ago. Uh, 
And typically, populations have escalated very rapidly since then, sort of eating up any real gains. There are, there are different stories. Uh, Korea, South Korea is a different story. Taiwan's a different story. But throughout much of Africa and Asia, even, in, even India, India's going to have one billion people next spring. So one in six persons on Earth is going to live in India, already does live in India. But there, the populations do tend to erode any long-term solutions. Now, I don't want to just say that it's population because it's a consumption problem, too. So the average American uh, consumes a great deal more than these many Indians. So there's a consumption problem, an escalating consumption problem, that's ours. And there's an escalating population problem that's theirs, and they may not be totally unrelated. Then the third general kind of problem is a, is a maldistribution problem. The general world orders are such now, global capitalism and so forth, that the rich tend to get richer and the poor tend to get poorer. We don't have good ways of getting the productivity of the world distributed in the right places. Previously, inside the United States, we could use a strong, reasonably strong federal government to give us uh, worker safety and to give us various kinds of environmental constraints and so forth. When business goes global, those, those tend to uh, weaken considerably, and we haven't sorted that out very well. So I hope we can, but uh, often I, I'm a bit pessimistic about that. One final question before I return to Janelle and that is, is it correct that as countries become much more prosperous uh, and successful, the birth rate goes down, but the consumption yeah. rate goes up? And so what do you see from that perspective uh, as we move uh, to this development economically? I I'm thinking of, two, for example, like Europe, where uh, they're uniting and uh, there's prosperity. And there are sections of the world where this is happening. Of course, Japan's been very popular and successful with its policies, but uh, are we going to maybe reduce population in a larger part of the world, but, but increase consumption? Uh, I think we will. Now, and you mustn't think, though, that the Europe, what's happened in Europe, where, where there's uh, prosperity and, and populations uh, decline, or at least birth rates decline dramatically from what they were uh, 50 years or a century ago. Uh, that can happen in other places, but it doesn't follow that what happened in Europe, where Europe was able to draw on the resources of their colonies, where Europe had a long-standing tradition of high education, de de dem democratic governments and whatever. It doesn't follow that it's going to work like that in Africa or in Asia or in, uh, in, in, even in China. China is kind of a tough case. So I think I hear you saying that in some parts of the world there's a possibility of growing prosperity but maybe continuing uh, very large uh, population growth with more consumption. Yeah. I'm not sure that I know anywhere in the world that, that wouldn't sort of enjoy or gradually reduce population. I don't know, Panhandle of Idaho, maybe you think you need a lot more people up here. Right? Even the state of Colorado, I think, is well populated at the present time. I'm not interested in having the next hundred years be like the last hundred years in the state of Colorado. And I bet you're not interested in having the next hundred years be like the last hundred years even in the state of Idaho. We've got to get into uh, what's generally called nowadays a more sustainable relation to uh, landscape. The next few hundred years just can't be like the last few hundred years in terms of the escalating growth and consumption, escalating appetites of consumption that we've had. Thank you. Danielle Burke. I'd like to follow along that same line of questioning. Um, very interesting. What ethical duty do we have to save for the future? And along that line, uh, you might comment on urban sprawl, if you would, because certainly when we go to urban centers now, we see the frustration of living far apart from the center of duties and responsibilities and so forth. Uh, but people frustrated with the freeway systems, and we're, mm -hmm. we're growing massive freeway systems. You grow a freeway system, and then people use it. Fill it up, and so then you add three or four more lanes, and it yes. fills those up, and you add three or four more lanes, and you fill those up, and you wonder why it isn't working. Right? <laughs> so what is our ethical duty to save some of what life is like now, as well as 
some of the natural resources. Well, humans belong on the planet. I, mean, I don't think humans belong on every square inch of the planet, so I'm very glad that I, I'm proud of Idaho. It's got a marvelous uh, wilderness conservation mm -hmm. network and all that. Uh, Colorado has a good one, but maybe not as impressive as this one. So I don't want to say that humans belong on every square inch of the planet, but they belong on the planet. And so, you know, we've got to uh, inhabit the planet. We're probably, in the United States, we're probably always going to inhabit 90% uh, of the landscape and put it to uh, multiple uses, as we say. Uh, where there's growth, where the cities grow, it's tough. Uh, I think there's probably a more intelligent way of fitting people on the landscape than the traditional suburban patterns that we've inherited from the 50s. In terms of interstates and whatever, I think the answer is probably a different kind of transportation system, you know, light rail or whatever. And of course, even now, we tend to take to the air ra rather than drive across the continent as a whole. So some things have changed. Uh, the urban sprawl, there's still a widespread wish for this kind of single, I mean, I live in one of these homes, single owner home with a yard and whatever. Uh, maybe on parts of the landscape, we can have that. We will have that on parts of the landscape. Maybe there's some parts of the landscape that we can sacrifice more with this in mind. But maybe other parts of the landscape, we shouldn't. For example, in Colorado, I can tolerate sprawl better on the plains than I can uh, 40 acre estates in the foothills, uh, for example. That seems to me to be a less intelligent. I mean, it's highly desirable, it's pleasurable to live in those kinds of circumstances, but I'm not sure that's a wise pattern of uh, land use. And should we be considering always the future, our children, the generations to come, what their quality of life is going to be like? Uh, certainly. Uh, don't you have a lot of Native Americans in this area? I think you do. Yes. They used to speak about uh, if you make decisions with seven generations in mind, it'll work out, right? Uh, most of us sort of know seven generations. I mean, if you think back, uh, you knew your grandparents, you maybe knew a great grandparent, maybe not. If you live a long time, you probably know some grandchildren, you might know a great grandchildren. So most of us sort of have connections across seven generations. Maybe we don't have enough uh, sort of evolutionary tendency to think about 100 years from now, 500 years from now, but most of these problems will be handled pretty well if we can get a seven generation span in mind, like the Native Americans have in cursors today. In, in relation to the ethical questions and the environment, in one of your books uh, is called Environmental Ethics. In the democratic process in particular, we give great emphasis to individualism, which is an important yes. point. But individualism at times also has to address the public interest and public good. How can we use uh, philosophy and ethics to make a compatible relationship between individualism and the public interest as it relates to the environment and the population growth and resources? You said this program's going five or six hours. So <laughs> yeah. it, it, we should for that alone. Should <laughs> <we go>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll have to uh, be more brief about that. Well, the United States, uh, the West in general, but the United States, the American West, maybe has got a somewhat exaggerated account of the sort of rugged individual. We got that through the cowboy heritage. We got that through Daniel Boone and David Crockett and Jim Bridger and all those guys that we greatly admire. Uh, and we think highly of our uh, private property rights and uh, the, the people who came and entered the land and carved out a living, we think they got the water rights and, and they uh, saw the first come, first served in terms of uh, these settlement patterns and whatever. That could be a chapter out of our history, though, that, that has to shift in, in the future. In fact, even if you go back to Europe, they don't have exactly the same high-profile sets of property rights over there. They think much more in terms of property is the uses of property is needing to fit in with the wishes and desires of the community. Okay, Americans have kind of been tend to bristle at that. You know, it's my property and I'll do just what I please with it, thank you. Don't go around telling me how to manage this property. But there are lots of other countries who see property rights in the larger context of a community good. 
maybe even in the United States, we can come to think of sort of property rights as attaching, be, being appropriate to the land. And so if you've got mountain land, you can do certain sorts of things with it. But if it's a uh, mountain land that's got wildlife on it, maybe the sorts of things you do with it do have to pay some attention to this wildlife. After all, wildlife's a public good. You don't own the wildlife on your land, for example. Uh, maybe property rights to some extent can be mellowed into a larger sense of the environmental integrity on the landscape. And that'll be a good thing for property owners. They might not like it in the short term, but once again in the long term, property owners want quality of life on the landscape just as much as anybody else. All right, what may happen upstream from your land and so forth, if there's certain protections, then you'll have more quality because it cannot uh, contaminate your own property. I mean, we don't live in isolation. We don't live in isolation. Uh, we rub elbows more than we ever did before, and to some extent our the concept of property rights need to take that into, into account. Of course, it's always been true that whatever you did on your property, if you had spillover effects, you know, your, uh, your cows got out and damaged somebody else's property, or you burnt trash and the, and the smoke went downstream, and it's, the tort law has always attended to that. But, but now we've had to tighten that up and have more intensive environmental regulation. I'm sure you're familiar with many of those. I wish that we could do what Bill Morris did with Joseph Campbell and have a 12-week series with you. You have that kind of wealth of information. But I do want to shift gears just a moment okay. uh, on something else that you're such an expert on, and that is science and religion and that relationship. And my question would be that uh, we often see conflict that we may or may not uh, interpret as that. Uh, certainly, when you get in the field of science, uh, we know that we have certain ideas and principles about the environment and population. And, Another question, whereas from religion we get into certain principles about uh, birth control and population. It's just an open-ended question, but I'd like for you to give us a few comments about how you see the relationship between the development of science and, and religious doctrine. Well, they're various kind of religions and they're various kind of sciences. In a general way, I, I think I'll keep my comments to uh, sort of monotheism that uh, we know primarily in the uh, West. And then uh, maybe mention uh, two general sorts of sciences, the physical sciences, physics, astronomy, that kind of thing. There, I think, relationships between a religious interpretation of the world and a scientific interpretation of the world are reasonably congenial, and they become more congenial in my lifetime. So sort of seeing God, if you like, in, with, and under the Big Bang once upon a time, uh, this kind of marvelous explosion of energy that when the universe started and developed. I don't think that's uh, all that uh, difficult. And of course, you can't have a uh, sort of six-day creation. You've got to have a much longer time span and whatever. But physics and religion, astrophysics and religion, are reasonably congenial. The tougher part is biology, okay, which has been Darwin's century as well. And I must say that our Dar Darwinian accounts of the evolution, evolutionary natural history, where there seems to be a certain uh, randomness, you like, a certain uh, genetic mutations that uh, are not uh, particularly designed for the benefit of the organism, and, and where there's nature red in tooth and claw, as it's sometimes said, although we probably ought to call it adapted fit, I think is a better phrase. But in any case, Dar Darwin and uh, religion are harder to reconcile. Uh, I, took, I took that on in this last book, Genes, Genesis, and God, because I, like, I guess I like uh, tough assignments, and I <laughs> think they can be reconciled, but that hasn't been easy. Now, if you want to get biologists together with uh, religious people, though, you can go back to the, the environmental emphasis we were talking about. If you want somebody interested in uh, saving creation, uh, you're about as likely to find that in a biologist as you are in a theologian. And if you get the two together, uh, they may well agree that uh, Christians and biologists of all stripes are keen on uh, saving the rainforest. So there's a way in which, at least there, biology and religion uh, are, can, can often share a common interest in the conservation of uh, biodiversity. 
We've interviewed people who are creationists and evolutionists, and from those interviews over the years, we have found different individuals that have a different definition of how God could have created and evolved and developed the earth. Is, is that part of your work and study that, that they can be compatible, that one can be, for example, an evolutionist and also be deeply a believer in, in the supreme power of God, or vice versa? I hope versa. so, because I am. Right. right. So the drift of the argument in this book is, well, I wouldn't want to say that it, it argues that, that you can begin with biology and prove God. That would be the wrong way to think about it. But it, that you can give an account of interpretation, uh, of interpretation of evolutionary history that sort of leaves open or invites asking whether there might not be uh, a divine power sort of in, with, and under this uh, marvelous creative process that has characterized our planet for uh, three and a half billion years. The general line of argument in this particular uh, last work of mine is that it, that has to do with the discovery of new information. When you pass from trilobites, it was an ancient form of life. When you pass from trilobites to dinosaurs, let's say, or when you pass from dinosaurs to mammals, or when you pass from uh, mammals to primates, uh, you need new orders and ranges of information. They're coded into the genes and so forth. And I guess the general argument of this book is that God is a kind of ambience of information, that God is a kind of source of at least the possibility space in which these creatures can self-develop. So I take that kind of general approach uh, myself. What an interesting note on which to bring our permanent conclusion. I hope you can come back sometime. We just Thank got you. started. We'd love to have you on we the have. program again. It's been a delight uh, meeting you and interviewing you. Uh, and Janelle, thank you for your fine questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you have found this program stimulating with our very highly qualified guests to deal with some very important questions that the human race uh, must face from day to day and year to year uh, as we deal with our future, our environment, and, and our philosophy, and our ethics, and our beliefs. Uh, and we've had a, a very great pleasure bringing this program to you today. Next week, we will turn to yet another issue. And I would like to invite you to be with us at that time when we will discuss uh, what we believe always is something of interest and importance to you. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>